Greetings, internet friend. In my quest to de-plastic my wardrobe, it only makes sense that we start from the bottom up. And by that, I mean skin layers first. In this video, I will attempt to reproduce a circa 1900s chemise from Mjøsmusea in Norway, pictures of which are available on our digital museum database, all of which are resources I will link to down below. I really liked this garment because of all the little details. The pin tucked yoke, which I had never done before, the crochet lace, which we will get more into later, and last but not least, the fact that instead of going the usual rectangles and triangles route for the body, the person who made this elected to do one side widening of the centerpiece and one side with triangle gores. We shall attempt to recreate this and pretend that the asymmetry does not bother us. To start with, I find it useful to double check my measurements. Undergarments such as chemises are not meant to sit tight against the skin, but it is still valuable to have at least a vague idea of critical measurements, in this case bust and hips, to ensure garments are at least not too small. An enthusiastic feline assistant is recommended for this step, but not required. So I have here a piece of one meter by 150 of this beautiful thin linen that I'm going to try to take most of the pieces for this chemise from. Now I'm pretty confident that we can get the body and the gauze and the sleeves and the gussets from this piece, but I'm a little less convinced that we can get the yoke as well just because it's heavily pin tucked, so probably about twice as long as I need haste it. Um, but yeah, I am quite curious about this because we know that fabric was expensive historically and valuable, so this seems a fun experiment to try out. First off, I am folding my washed and pressed piece of fabric double at a distance that roughly equals my bust measurements plus maybe 6-7 to seven inches, which will become the bottom of my triangle gores and seam allowance. I then add a straight line of about 4 inches on either end of the fabric for ease of hemming and draw a diagonal line between the bottom and the top. I am not going off my larger hip measurement, because the gores will take care of that. With the long piece of fabric that I have left, I cut the sleeves and the gussets. Note that I am being an idiot right here and am somehow electing to not use my brain and cut the sleeves according to my upper arm measurements, which were right there in the little notebook next to me. Don't be like me, use this entire piece to cut two sleeves and two smaller gussets. No leftover piece that you will have to piece into the sleeve later. As predicted, I did not have enough fabric for the yoke, so I am cutting an additional 8 inch or 22 cm strip of fabric to pin tuck from which I intend to cut the front and back yoke pieces. Note here that I am yet again forgetting to use my brain because somehow I didn't think to muck up the yoke before this step. And I'm cutting this piece with a vague assumption that it will be roughly big enough. It was not, in fact, big enough. I would also like to introduce you all to Freya, my heavy hand-turned sewing machine friend, as I do believe this is her first official appearance on this channel. First off, I am experimenting a little with general pin tuck technique, 
depth, distance, etc. Experimentation in hand, I then went over my fabric and added lines 5 eighths of an inch apart. Yes, I am European and really should be using metric, but this clear ruler that I inherited is all I have and it uses inches, but it works. The fabric is then carefully folded at the pencil line using just the force of our fingers and nails. Luckily, linen is pliable in this regard, so no further force or physical restraint is necessary. Just as carefully, we sew a line a little distance from the edge. This should be the same distance each time. In this instance, I am trying to keep my edge halfway between my needle and the rightmost edge of my presser foot. Repeat for every single one of your lines. Behold, the pin tucks. They are done and pressed and pressed again and looking nice, but it is a way smaller piece than I thought it would be. I thought that it would still be like a meter of fabric, that it would take like a third of the total fabric width, but it took more than that. Like I measured this and it's a little over 80 centimeters, so I only have, I think, just enough to chew the front and the back yoke. I then procrastinated fiercely because fitting the yoke scared me. Next, we have the sleeves, which, per previous mention, we must first piece an additional strip of fabric onto before we can get on to the interesting stuff. I am doing this with one seam allowance longer than the other because I will be folding them under on the same side later. Our seam is then pressed open, folded under and pinned. before carefully stitching along the very edge of our fold. The triangular gores are then aligned in the same way as our sleeve piecings, one end further out than the other, before it too is stitched and felt. Now onto the part I should have done much sooner, making a pattern for the yoke. I will spare you the endless length of footage where I am just scratching my head and trying to figure out how this all works. What I attempted was to measure my shoulders, the approximate slope and distance, as well as how far down I thought the yoke extended based on the picture. From the neckline I tried making a shape, checked in the mirror, and try it again, and again, and again. At the end I had a piece I thought might work, but the bottom edge of the yoke was now too high up, leading me to reattach the piece I had cut off earlier to make a longer tip, arrow, thingy. Patterning yokes is no joke. Our pattern was then transferred to our pin tucks and subsequently cut out. Before attaching the body of our chemise to our yoke, we must first insert our gathering threads. I am doing two gathering threads here trying to match up the two threads as best I can in an attempt to get neater gathers. The fabric is then folded double and pressed lightly to mark the middle, which is pinned to the center of the oak. The two edges are likewise pinned to the edges of the oak and we commence attempts of gathering evenly across the board before pinning everything as securely into place as we can manage. 
there may have been some frustration involved in this copious overuse of pins. Along with stitching the body of the chemise, we are taking the time while we are at the machine to stitch up both shoulder seams as well before a thorough press. This time, I did not do that thing where I misaligned the two seam allowances in order to fell them down later. This was simply because I had not decided which side I thought would be easiest to fell down from. In the end, I decided to cut down the pin tucked side and fell with the gathered side. On the original, there is a thin piece of matching ribbon sewn on at just this spot, presumably to hide whatever they did on the inside. However, I did not have any suitably matching ribbon to hand in my stash and, as we are already making our own lace, it seemed a tad too extra even for me to weave a ribbon to go with this project as well. Instead, it was simply omitted, and any stitches showing on the outside would just be allowed to do their thing. Cover your eyes, proper sewing enthusiasts! I am now in the home stretch of things I realize I need. And, because clipping into the neckline to fold and stitch sounds like it will be a hassle and quite bulky, I am electing to bind the neckline with a thin piece of linen instead. This binding will come from this tiniest piece of scrap I have left from the original 1 meter fabric piece, whether it wants to or not. And the way we are accomplishing this is to measure our strips at the first line below 1 inch that our ruler will allow. For me, that is 7 eighths of an inch in order to get 4 strips, which will be just enough for our neckline with a little bit to spare. I would also like to extend a warning to any misguided soul who may wish to similarly work with binding this thin in the future. While I love the look of narrow binding, it can be a pain to attach because of aforementioned narrowness and general small margins. I would only recommend this for thin and reasonably tightly woven fabrics, as anything too loose will fray apart before you even have a chance to approach it with your needles. For our sleeves, we are attaching our little gusset pieces and finishing off the sleeve before anything else. The gusset is backstitched on one side onto the top edge of our sleeve It is then folded um, approximately like so such that two adjoining corners meet inside the sleeve and the two unattached pieces are facing where the armhole will be attached I am then felling down all the seams in preparation of not wanting to do this when everything is attached to the chemise. While we are in felling mode, I am also folding in and felling the edge of the sleeves. This is only folded once because they are all selvage edges. Finally, our sleeve is attached to the rest of the chemise. This is done with the chemise facing wrong side out, but the sleeve facing right side out. This is because sleeves are witchcraft and must be properly confusing to work right. The sleeve is then inserted into the body of the chemise like so, pinned in place and backstitched into place. Yes. I am stitching this by hand because these are sleeves and all sleeves demand your respect even if these don't even have right left orientation. Any lapse in attention or due reverence while working on sleeves will result in disaster and possibly the world ending, so proceed with caution. After attaching the sleeves, we are moving on to the final stretch of the sewing part, namely the gorse. Or 
That is to say, the one bore for the one side, because the other side is already in possession of the necessary curvature. No, we are not changing that, even though we are tempted to. As is becoming the theme of this little project, seams are pinned, stitched and felled, before the whole thing is pinned and likewise sewn onto the chemise. These scores extend into the sleeve, so to spare myself the frustration of trying to make that look even remotely decent by machine, I am stopping an inch or so from the sleeve and doing that last little fiddly bit by hand. This is then of course repeated on the other side, but is a much more enjoyable experience after the sleeve has been inserted since there are no gores to fiddle with, so we can just stitch up the side seams once the sleeve is in. Lastly, for the sewing part, we are just quickly hemming the bottom of our chemise by machine. Now, onto the lace. Several moments spent gandering on this detailed picture from the museum by both myself and my much more experienced friend tells us that this piece of lace is made by crochet. Telltale signs include general sturdiness of appearance and the shell-shaped strip at the bottom. For those of you who are familiar with crochet patterns, I will leave a link to the free pattern I was lucky enough to find online from a website called My Pico. This was so close to an exact replica of the lace in the picture that I could scarcely believe it. The little deviation that was apparent was such that even a novice crocheter like myself was able to figure out a way to make it look like I wanted. First off, we are making a chain of five chain stitches. From these five stitches, we are making a shell by inserting three treble stitches into the first chain stitch, followed by three chain stitches, and then three more treble stitches in the same first chain stitch. Follow up with five chain stitches, before doing another two times three shell stitch in the gap made by the last three chain stitches between the trebles. Now two chain stitches. Attach to first treble of the row below with a new treble. Five chain stitches. Turn. Treble into treble stitch below. Two more chain stitches. And another two by three shell stitch followed by five chain stitches. The side that has two chain stitches and trebles will continue to grow one square at a time until a distinct triangle shape is formed. In this pattern, there are six shells for each triangle. When you have done six shells in this fashion, you start over again. Repeat until desired length of lace is reached. But we are not done yet. We then turn and do a series of chain stitches and slip stitches along the bottom of our work. This is to create a straight line next to the shells that we saw in the museum piece. We turn again, starting with five chain stitches, followed by a treble, two chain stitches, treble, etc. All the way back up for a sort of box effect. Finally, we are doing the part I liked the least, the picots decorating the outside of the triangles. This is done with a slip stitch in each chain stitch, followed by three chain stitches, who are turned into a small loop by slip stitching it into itself above the treble below. This last bit is finicky and not at all cooperative. Rude. Repeat this for each piece of lace you will need. I am electing to make each piece for sleeves and neckline individually, instead of one long piece to cut up. I imagine this reduces fraying, but more experienced crocheters may weigh in. Maybe I'm just being too paranoid. The lace is then pressed. 
The short end is hidden before the long end is used to stitch together our lace into a circle the size of our intended recipient. Crochet lace is somewhat stretchy so you can get away with small differences, but that also means you need to pay attention while attaching so that you don't accidentally stretch it too much and end up with way too much lace for however much fabric you have left to sewn it onto. I am doing this right sides together to get the lace as flush with the fabric as I am able. And with that, our new chemise is finally complete. I have to admit that, even though the yoke ended up clearly too short and should probably have been twice as long, I'm still a big fan. Using pin tucks or other seam details like this to make a more interesting yoke bit is a look I'm very much in favor of and have been eager to try out. 10 out of 10, we'll experiment more with yoke design in the future. That is all I have for you this time around. Please enjoy this furry goblin who has fallen in love with sleeping in my fabric shelf. Until next time. <laughs>